He was born in Washington, D.C. in 1912, son of a black army officer whose career was badly stunted by segregation. He attended West Point, where he believed his classmates would accept him because of his character and not his race. He was wrong. For four years, he was shunned. He despised segregation and was determined to destroy it. He was turned down for flight training because there were no black flying units. When blacks were finally allowed to become flyers, he was their commander, and they were the Tuskegee Airmen. Under his leadership, the men of the 99th Pursuit Squadron and the 332nd Fighter Group became renowned for never losing a bomber they escorted to fighter attack, a feat unmatched by any other group. With World War II behind him, he took up a new fight to destroy segregation within the military. He won that battle too. He went on to serve with great distinction, became the first Air Force black general officer, and saw his dream of an integrated Air Force and a more tolerant nation come true. He's an American. He's an American who contributed to the victory in World War II. He's an American who contributed to the victory in all the wars after that. He's an American who contributed to whatever we gained during the Vietnam War through his command of the 13th Air Force. He's an American. His name is Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., and he is a legend of air power. Young Ben Davis was born in Washington, D.C. on December 18, 1912. But by his third birthday, his mother had died, giving birth to his sister Lenora. While his father traveled to different army postings, he and his sister were raised by their grandparents and aunts and uncles until his father remarried and they could once again be together. He attended segregated schools in Washington during his early years but feels he got an excellent education. As a teenager, he moved with his father to Cleveland, Ohio, where he attended integrated schools for the first time. And he excelled academically and athletically. He was president of his senior class in high school and lettered in track. He was determined to follow in his father's footsteps as a military man and applied to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. While he awaited his acceptance, he briefly attended Wayne State University and the University of Chicago to improve his math skills. He entered West Point in 1932 with great hopes and was sure his classmates would accept him for his character and merit. He could not have been more wrong. General Davis shared with me, Tess, you really don't know how bad it was for me and for others. And I said, sir, can you explain? It was difficult, but he knew it was going to be that difficult. He was prepared for the inevitable. He withstood the silencing. His very best friend, and of course his bride of over 60 years, Miss Agatha, came to visit him at every opportunity. And many times that was the only person that General Davis spoke to until she actually came back in social conversation the next time to visit. Now, of course, he participated in his classroom situations, but nothing on a personal basis by either his classmates or upperclassmen. He was completely silenced. His fellow cadets silenced him for his entire four years. In his senior year at West Point, he was given orientation flights in Air Corps airplanes. And from that first flight, he decided on a military flying career. But when he applied, he was told he would not be accepted because the Army had no black flying units. The segregation of Benjamin Davis, Jr. continued. His classmates had hoped the silence would force Cadet Davis to resign. He stuck it out and graduated in 1936 in the top third of his class. He left West Point vowing to fight segregation, and for the rest of his life, he did. He was assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia, and the infantry school where his former classmates continued their silence. 
There was one exception when former classmate Lieutenant William Westmoreland stopped by Davis's quarters for a visit. He accepted that man without any problem. He didn't ask him, why did you do it? He just made the rationalization, I almost said excuse, but it wasn't an excuse. He rationalized that that was a sign of the times. That's what was characteristically done at those times. He accepted it and moved on. It did not diminish General Westmoreland's overall being or his status as an understanding human. He was a victim, as many of us are, of our circumstances. And I think General Davis articulated that to me in that fashion. And it's judgy lest you be judged. And he lives by that, that rule. Westmoreland went on to be the commanding general in Vietnam and chief of staff of the U.S. Army. After Fort Benning, Davis moved to Fort Riley, Kansas, where he served as the aide-de-camp for his father, Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis, Sr. His father had been promoted by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to help ensure the black vote during the 1940 election. But Roosevelt did one more thing for the Davises and other black military men who aspired to fly. He promised prominent black community leaders that if he were re-elected with a strong black vote, he would form a black flying school and the 99th Pursuit Squadron in the Army Air Corps. Roosevelt was re-elected and he fulfilled his promise. Since there was no other Black West Pointer in the Army, the brass focused on Davis to be the 99th's commander. He was given a flight physical at Fort Riley where his father was stationed and he was aide de camp to his father. The flight surgeon, not knowing that the Air Corps had decided that they were going to allow blacks to serve, failed him because he had epilepsy. My God, if he had epilepsy, he couldn't have been an officer in the first place. This, the sham continued. A flight surgeon got the word that, no, 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 we don't want him failed. We want him to command this organization. Then he was passed and he was sent to Tuskegee. In the spring of 1941, the first 13 Tuskegee Airmen began flight training. The white mindset of the time was convinced that the Tuskegee Airmen would fail and that no black man could become a pilot, much less a fighter pilot. They thought blacks were lazy, childlike, and incompetent. They were also thought to lack the hand-eye coordination and physical dexterity necessary to be a fighter pilot. The litmus test was different for black Americans at that time than it was for white Americans. There were so many things to prove. And it wasn't just that they were capable of flying airplanes, but there had been so many misrepresentations that blacks were uncontrollable. They lacked discipline. And General Davis set out to show that, yes, if there are rules, you must follow them. I follow them. And I'm only going to ask of you that which I would do myself. In the spring of 1942, the first five black flyers graduated as Army Air Force pilots. Captain Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. was there. Well, here we are, and I'm looking at a picture that was taken back in 1942. And I must say that it takes me back in memory a long way. I see a lot of old friends here. This one class went on, of course. It was followed each month by a new set of graduates. Enough were finally graduated, the first 25, to form a fighter squad. And this was called in those days the 99th Pursuit Squad. We left the old T-6 and started flying T-40. training in the United States, the 99th Pursuit Squadron was fully manned and trained and sent to North Africa, where they hoped to get into the fight. The group was assigned to the 33rd Pursuit Group, but from day one, they were rigidly segregated from the rest of the group. And the 33rd's commander even refused to provide experienced flight leads to lead them into battle the first time, a practice that was afforded every other group. 
And when they did not perform magnificently in the beginning, the commander of the 33rd started a campaign to get them removed from combat, which failed. But he started a campaign that was ratified at every level, including the commanding general of the United States, Army Air Forces, Hap Arnold. But the Army Chief of Staff, General George Marshall, had a question and decided to have a study done. Lieutenant Colonel Davis, back in the United States at the time to pick up the 332nd Fighter Group, was brought to Washington, where he successfully defended his command and was given more time for them to prove themselves. Performance is the absolute key in combat. And when I speak of performance, I mean it's either the delivery of bombs on target, it's the escort of uh, heavy bombers in those days, which were B-17s and B-24s, to protect the bombers, to prevent them from getting shot down by enemy fighters. The 99th Pursuit Squadron was an expert in dropping bombs and hitting targets with bullets and hitting locomotives. He was also an expert in area, aerial combat. The 99th Squadron did one thing at Andrio that no other squadron did. It shot down 15 enemy airplanes. summer of 1943, Captain Charles Hall shot down their first enemy fighter, a German Focke-Wolf 190 with his obsolete Curtis P-40 Warhawk. The victory prompted General Eisenhower to come by to congratulate Hall in person. Meanwhile, the 332nd Fighter Group arrived in Italy and was given another obsolete fighter, the war-weary Bell P-39 Era Cobra. But they made them work and fought on courageously with a close air support mission protecting troops on the ground. Force bombers were taking heavy losses to German fighters. And the 332nd was given a new mission and new aircraft. First, flying Republic P-47 Thunderbolts and later North American P-51 Mustangs. The Red Tails, as the Tuskegee Airmen became known by the bomber groups, began escorting the bombers and did an exceptional job. Flying uh, to the Kowalski airfields, flying to southern Germany, flying to Berlin even, uh, a 1,500-mile flight by the group. Some 72 airplanes, took, uh, Mustangs, took part in that uh, flight in March of 45. I'd make this big point. Here's old Spanky Roberts, uh, here's uh, Mac Ross, Custis, there's Span Watson who works over in the FAA right now. All of these men performed these types of missions. They flew 200 missions, escort missions, perhaps 10,000 sorties. Between May of 44 and April of 45, when they stopped flying, they never lost a bomber to an enemy fighter. And there is not another outfit in the United States Army Air Forces that can make that claim. The accomplishments of the 332nd Fighter Group taught the Army Air Force that if you give a black man the same training you give a white man, He'll do the same job. 
That's not a revolutionary idea today, but it certainly was to white America in 1944 and 1945. The general was a straight arrow. He kept a lot of young men straight. They didn't appreciate it at the time, but I think they all appreciated later in life. He's always been my number one man, and uh, he just was a straight arrow and taught you how the job should be done. Through it all, Davis was a tough commander who kept his fighter group tightly disciplined. He felt his men could make no mistakes if the Tuskegee Airmen were to break down the barriers of segregation. If you cross the line, General Davis would pull you back or give you an article, whatever it required, to get your attention to bring you back. If you misrepresented or disrespected the uniform that you wore, he definitely called their hands on it. He was a tough disciplinarian. And of course, again, that's all his training. He was reared as a tough person. When Davis returned to the States in 1945, he was given command of the 477th Composite Group at Godman Field, Kentucky. The group moved to Lockbourne Army Air Base, Ohio in 1946, where Davis commanded both the flying units and was base commander. He supported many all-white units on the base, and inspection records show only harmonious relations prevailed between the Tuskegee Airmen and their tenants. Davis and his Tuskegee Airmen overcame local bigotry through professionalism and continued to undermine the tenets of segregation. Disproving the century-old myth that whites could never work for blacks, they did it and did it well. By 1947, the Air Force was reeling from the massive demobilization that followed World War II. They were experiencing shortages in manpower in every command, and job and segregation was making it even tougher to put the right people where they were needed. In 1947, when the Air Force became independent, the chief of personnel, a man by the name of Ilwal Edwards, wanted a study done to prove something he already knew was true, that segregation was not necessary. At Lockbourne, where Davis was in 1947, he had surplus radial engine mechanics that could have been used in the Strategic Air Command where they used the same engine but could not be used because they were black and the Strategic Air Command was white. General Davis saw that it was very, very difficult to try to accomplish a military mission by separating the talents of, of the individuals at which you were going to work with. And so he worked hard to try to correct that. Not so much, I don't think, from uh, his, his work at the time wasn't specifically about racial equality, even though that's the direct result. He was really concerned about the mission, and he tried to describe that uh, to people. The Air Force announces in April of 48 that it's going to integrate. Several months before Truman's executive order, and much to the dismay of the Secretary of the Army, Kenneth Royale, who insists that the Air Force stay in segregation like the Army is going to stay in segregation. In May of 1949, the Air Force integrates, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy does not. In 1949, Colonel Davis attended the Air War College in the bastion of racism and bigotry at the time, Montgomery, Alabama. He and his wife were banned from the best restaurants, hotels, and housing in the city. Southern society was not willing to move at the same rate as the Air Force, and discrimination raised its ugly head again for the Davises. But again, he toughed it out and graduated among the top in the class. After graduation in 1950, he was assigned to the Pentagon to be chief of the Air Defense Branch of Air Force Operations, a prestigious position where he supervised white officers and enlisted men. He was so successful at the Pentagon that he was assigned to take command of the 51st Fighter Interceptor Wing at Suwon Air Base, South Korea, in 1953. Again, he excelled, commanding a wing of thousands of airmen, most of them white. Davis was reassigned to Japan as director of operations for the Far East Air Force. Shortly after his arrival, he became the first black Air Force officer to be promoted to Brigadier General. He went on to the most significant post-war assignment of his career as Vice Commander of the 13th Air Force and Commander of Air Task Force 13 Provisional in Taipei, Taiwan. After two years in the Far East, he moved halfway around the world to Germany, 
where he became director of operations for the U.S. Air Forces in Europe and gained his second star. Now Major General Davis returned to the Pentagon as director of manpower and organization and within four years was promoted once again to lieutenant general. With three stars, he moved to Korea as chief of staff of the United Nations Command and U.S. Forces Korea. Then in 1967, General Davis became the commander of the 13th Air Force in the Philippines. His command included more than 55,000 people all over Asia, including many thousands who were flying and fighting in the Vietnam War. After a year in the Philippines, General Davis was summoned back to the United States as deputy commander of U.S. Strike Command. Lieutenant General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. retired from the Air Force in 1970 after more than 33 years of active duty. As I and others look back on it, uh, the impact that General Davis had on the military, the Air Force, and the nation at that time is as significant as the war itself, World War II itself, because that was truly a, a, a turning point in my mind for the nation. Today, we advance to the rank of four-star general Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., a hero in war, a leader in peace, a pioneer for freedom, opportunity, and basic human dignity. He earned this honor a long time ago. Our armed forces today are a model for America and for the world of how people of different backgrounds working together for the common good can perform at a far more outstanding level than they ever could have divided. Perhaps no one is more responsible for that achievement than the person we honor today. To all of us, General Davis, you are the very embodiment of the principle that from diversity we can build an even stronger unity. And that in diversity we can find the strength to prevail and advance. He is a great leader, a great patriot, and a great American. And for this, he is a legend of air power.